Hi, I am Tiffany Bevelin, the CEO and founder of Dreams Recycled, and I am here today with Tiffany Hughes Esquire from the Tiffany Hughes Law Firm in Chicago, which is a great law firm if you live in that area. And she's also a friend of mine. So I'm very excited to have to come on my show today. Hi, Tiffany. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, I was going to say, and our poor listeners, they're going to be confused, the two Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany and Tiffany, but, but it's all good. Okay. So, so one of the things that I get contacted a lot about, Tiffany, is, um, is kind of what people should do before divorce. Now, I was an idiot, and I just um, <laughs> told my ex I wanted a divorce, and then miraculously, everything disappeared. So, mm. so as Are a, you talking about like assets and property? Um, I'm talking about paperwork, you know, financials, anything like just I had no access to. And so, right. um, so I guess my first question for you is, what do you say is the most sensible way to go about getting stuff ready for divorce? And what are some of the practical tips that everyone can do before they even kind of get to your office? Of course. And so just as a disclaimer, you know, I'm an attorney. I'm licensed in the state of Illinois. I'm not licensed in Florida, although I hope to be very soon. I am taking the bar um, in Florida in February of 2018. So hopefully we'll have an update with some, yeah, with, with, with some uh, Florida law. But um, just for everybody listening, if I mention anything in regards to law, it's only applicable in the state of Illinois. Um, as far as, I mean, Tiffany, that's a great question. I mean, I think... You know, what happens with most of my clients is, is, you know, they sit down with their spouse and they start to discuss the potential possibility of divorcing. And I think, you know, if you, if you're the person who's going to be initiating the conversation, or even if you're not, and you're, you know, you have a feeling that um, this conversation is going to take place soon. Right. What well, I would recommend we, doing. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, because I think we all know that's coming. We can bury right. our heads in the sand for a certain amount of time, but we kind of know that this is where it's headed. So, Right. Yeah. And, and that's what I would say is that if you know that that's where it's going to be headed, um, then what I would say to do is, you know, any joint accounts that you guys have together, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, you have the statements and you have access to the account. There's a lot of my clients they don't even know what accounts they have. Um, no, that's how I was. <laughs> right. And because, you know, I mean, and it's common, right? Because mm -hmm. if you think of it this way, usually, usually one person is kind of in charge of something. And so there's one person that's in charge of financials and there's one person that's in charge of grocery shopping and, you mm -hmm. know, et cetera. So it's not uncommon to have, you know, one individual in charge of just the finances and kind of not having an idea of really what accounts you have. So if you're headed down this road, I would definitely recommend one of the first things you want to do is, you know, verifying where your accounts are held, making right. sure that you have your account numbers. Um, I would, and if it was me, I would go as far as even keeping a electronic record of uh -huh. all of the statements. Right. So you don't have to print everything out. I mean, you can if you want to, if it's easier. A lot of people like to print things out. Uh -huh. I just think it's easier if you just to store it all mm -hmm. somewhere safe and keep it just in case for the future. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my first step in regards to kind of what to do before you even sit down to have the conversation. Right. And I have, um, a, quest I have a question. Um, which I'm sure probably our listeners want to know too. So you just said about electronic records. So um, when you do your financial affidavit and you have to produce all these documents, can you produce them um, electronically or do you have to print them out at that point? Well, usually what we do is, you know, I'll have the clients go ahead and send them to me electronically. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course you can mail them, but most people just don't do that because it's easier just to download it and attach mm -hmm. it to an email and send it over. And at my firm, you know, it's everything is encrypted and secured. So all your financial information is safe. Okay. So there's no issue in regard to exchange of financials like via email on my mm -hmm. server. Um, but I mean, you could pretty, when you do it, when you actually submit it, to the you know to the court mm -hmm. 
-hmm. In the state of Illinois, we don't attach the financials, like the actual statements, because whatever you attach and file with the court becomes public record. So Uh, we would never attach the documents itself to, you know, a financial affidavit. We would tender it to opposing counsel, and we would also provide a proof of service that we would file with the court that would say what we tendered. So we tendered, you know, bank statements from Mm -hmm. uh, Bank of America checking account ending in 1424 from September 2016 to date, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good information. I'm sure people didn't know that. I didn't know that. So that's awesome. And I think that's true. I think that unfortunately, well, fortunately depends on if your marriage is, you know, good or not or ends badly. But I think you're right. We, we by nature kind of divvy up who does what, who has more, you know, time and influence with the children, who does more cooking, who does more laundry, who does the financials, who does whatever. And unfortunately, um, in divorce, that can come back and bite you in the bottom if you don't know what's going on. And I hear, yeah, and I, I, as, as I told you, I was one of those people, but I hear it, you know, every day. And it's not actually, it's not actually always the women. Sometimes it's the men who don't know what's going on. Yep. That's true. That's very true. Um, There's a lot of men, um, clients of mine who I just have no idea. And, you know, another thing that I would mention is if you have any valuables, you know, mm-hmm. if any, any kind of gifts or jewelry or anything that is of, you know, um, substantial value, Mm -hmm. I would recommend, you know, putting in a safe place that the other party doesn't have access to, Uh, Um, you know, because what ends up happening is these items go missing and Uh being able to prove who took it, if they took it, when they took it, where it is now Mm. is a huge issue that, that does arise quite frequently. So you know, I would just recommend taking that, taking those items, if there's something that can fit in the safety deposit box in a short term basis, you know, doing that or mm-hmm. give them to family and friends to hold so mm-hmm. that they don't end up missing. Because when they do, it's very hard to recover. You know, of course, yeah. I can file what's known as a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction mm-hmm. asking the court to um, reframe, uh, from, reframe the other, let me repeat that, to um, in to stop the other party from either, right. you know, liquidating assets, taking uh-huh. personal property, or otherwise removing items from the marital yeah. residence. Well, but you don't want to go that route. Well, no, and I have to say, I mean, I think you touched on some good points because I I always tell divorcees about every single part of their divorce, not just the legal part but all of it, that you should obviously hope for the best and hope for it to be amicable. But the reality is you have to plan for the worst. And right. um, and like I said about the assets, I hear that story a lot, things going missing. I mean, even things like passports and social security cards. And, you know, people do the most ridiculous things to each other during their divorce. And, um, and if you can avoid any of that, then obviously that's a good thing. And... Um, and I think that's right, you know, anyway, whether it's um, uh, financial documents, whether it's valuables, whether it's important, you know, travel things or whatever it is, or heirlooms, heirlooms is Heirloom. one, yep. someone's, you know, grandma's clock or something that, that they know, unfortunately, means a lot to the other person. So Yeah, um, and I, I've had I've had certificates like their um, specific certificates for employment and degrees and things oh, wow. that have gone missing that were taken out of like for mm-hmm. example out of the office desk drawer in their home that was wow. completely cleared out. So I would just be very cautious in making sure that you know you have your your personal valuables and the things that you know mean a lot to you Mm -hmm. put somewhere safe and the second thing in regard to the financials obviously make sure that you have an idea what's going on there Mm -hmm. and you know obviously I don't recommend touching anybody else's stuff I you know leave that stuff for the other party uh, the other individual Mm -hmm. just make sure you safeguard and protect yourself so that you don't have to go to court and litigate Mm -hmm. over you getting your items back 
Yeah. No, because I'm sure that becomes very expensive, very frustrating, very upsetting on top of everything else that everyone's going through as a divorcee. And so, you know, we advocate that dreams recycled and I know you do, you know, where possible, treat each other respectfully and do the right thing. And um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it should be like that. Unfortunately, you know, it sometimes it's not. And mm-hmm. the majority of the time I feel like it's not because it's just, there's so much feeling um, right. and you know, a lot of the times it's a lot of feelings of, of hatredness mm-hmm. and bitterness and, you know, people just want to, you know, litigate to the death. Right. Yeah. They, yeah. They've been through a court of law, which is, is a sad reflection of our times, but as you know, very well, this happens daily. And I advise a client, I advise clients against it all the time. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's not good for the family. It's not good for the children. Mm-hmm. It's not good for either of the parties. It's not going to get them, you know, anywhere that they want to get, you know, where they want to go. Mm-hmm. So it's, there's a, there's a better way of doing that. And that's why my approach at, at practicing law in this area is, you know, I'm a pit bull and I'm a shark mm-hmm. in the courtroom and, mm-hmm. you know, my clients hire me because of that. But at the end of the day, my goal isn't to litigate the case. Mm-hmm. My goal is to settle because that's what's good for the kids and mm-hmm. that's what's good for the parties. And, you know, my number one priority is making sure that, you know, the children are safe and that the mm-hmm. children are, you know, in any way, shape or form, you know, minimized from any kind of harm mm-hmm. from this whole process. Because, you know, what they say is that there's two major life changing um, events that can occur to a child that are extremely detrimental in, right. to them now and to them going forward. The first one is moving. Uh-huh. And the second one is divorce. Right. So in this case, mm-hmm. and, and when you have a divorce, you're probably going to move and right. your parents are getting divorced. Right. So how do we minimize the effects on this process um, for them? And how do I enable each party to be able to have access, you know, to the children and have parenting time with the children in a way that's going to be in the best interest of the children. So there's so much involved, you know, from the very beginning. And that's another thing, you know, when a lot of people ask me, when do I sit down the kids and tell them that mommy and daddy are getting divorced? And, Uh you know, it's a, it's a good question. I don't have a solid answer on it. You know, it, I think parents are going to know when it's the appropriate time because they know their kids the best. I think, mm-hmm. I think as soon as there's a change in the household, when one party, you know, is no longer living in the house anymore, I think right. obviously that's a great time to mm-hmm. explain that why mom mm-hmm. or dad might not be here living here anymore. But well, so, no, no, so I was going to say, and I think it's, I think it really varies on the age of your children. <laughs> you know, and what kind of relationship you have, as in, you know, is there a lot of fighting and yelling and arguing and your children are well aware of what's going on? Or are you very amicable and you can kind of somehow kind of fake it till you make it till one of you moves out? But I I, I always tell our customers and clients that, you know, children are much smarter than we give them credit for. They see Oh, absolutely. They see everything, (laughs) they hear everything. So, you know, unless you're very, very good at it, um, it's better they hear from you than from a neighbor or somebody on the playground or, you know, some other horrible stories I've heard. um, Right. Because it breaks even more trust between the parent and the child. And if I can say anything, and I know this is probably just a very, very silly comment to make because it's so obvious. It's like blatantly obvious. But don't argue in front of the kids. And mm-hmm. don't talk about divorce with the, with the children when you both haven't at least sat down and discussed when you were going to explain to the children that this is going on. Right. You don't want to involve them. For one, I mean, for obvious reasons, it's not going to be good for their mental, physical, or emotional well-being. Right. But two, I mean, courts, courts frown, you know, so much on this. Mm-hmm. It's, you don't, you don't want to be that person. And, I know that in the heat of the moment that things might be said to the children, you want to avoid that at all costs, uh, well, anytime you, you can. 
Yeah, you have to obviously, I mean, same thing, very cliche, try and put your children first. And you also have to keep your emotions in check to a certain amount, which is, you know, not always easy. And, um, but you have to be the adult, right? The children didn't ask for the divorce. The children probably don't want it. There's only two adults in the family unit. They're the people who really have to, you know, figure it out and be the responsible ones. Right. Well, a lot of times what ends up happening is, you know, during the divorce proceedings, um, you know, the parent might be up late at night and Mm -hmm. let's say that they're reading through legal documents. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids gets out of bed and comes downstairs and say, and says, Hey mom, what are you doing? And, and, you know, she's looking at the documents and she feels Mm -hmm. as though the child is of age where she can explain, you know, what she's reading. That Mm -hmm. should absolutely never occur. You know, they're minor children for a reason, you know, Mm -hmm. an eight and nine year old, a 10 year old, in my personal opinion, I think even, you know, 15, 16 years old is still, I mean, they're still classified as a minor child Mm -hmm. and whether or not they're going to understand exactly what this process is, is, is very slim to none. And I just don't think it's appropriate, but I've had cases where, Mm -hmm. you know, they, the parent, you know, speaks to the children about the litigation Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you can't do that. Well, we have orders in place specifically to bar that. Well, yeah, and it's never good to make your child your, uh, you know, an adult best friend when they're a minor, right? Exactly. But you're in such a, you're in such a deep and dark place at times throughout this process because, you know, obviously at one point you loved the other individual and you had a close relationship with the other other individual. So a lot of people feel like not only are they, lo- are they losing their spouse, but they're also losing their best friend and, mm-hmm. you know, the father or the mother of their children and, they, you know, they feel like the children are a great outlet for them to communicate with because that's kind of all they have left. And no matter what ever happens, do not discuss litigation with the children. Right. You know, go and I think everybody that goes through this process and I think everybody in general, I think it's great to have a counselor who you can speak with. And I know Mm -hmm. Tiffany, I know I think you have some great um, individuals on your website that, um, you know, that I think the listeners yes. could, could look up and, and definitely contact um, as a reference point. You know, it's great. Going to counseling is a good thing. Mm-hmm. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it. And especially when you go through a process like this, no, it's and you- key to, you know, to just making sure that your well-being is, mm-hmm. is in check. No, and that's a good point. I mean, we have um, life coaches, divorce coaches, counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, because obviously everyone has different needs. And um, right. we, do, we, ha- we partner with uh, um, people that we believe do a good job in their field. Um, and people are free to contact us and we will uh, kind of triage you to people in your area who will hopefully be a good fit for you. And, uh, yeah, and I, I would tell the listeners, you know, definitely utilize utilize the tools that you have available, you know, through Tiffany and through the website. And, you know, if, if you're contemplating divorce or if you're going through a divorce or whatever it may be, you know, reaching out and having these, you know, available resources to you are, are key because yeah. it's not something that's very common. And I know that, you know, in the state of Illinois, that it, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm very happy to be working with Tiffany and, and in this, you know, in this whole realm of, of divorce because people feel very, very lonely and they feel vulnerable and they're angry. And like I said, they, they have feelings of hatredness and, Mm -hmm. you know, I I can tell you this. I think that having a great attorney and I, I'm a little biased, but you know, I'm the founding partner of, of my firm. Um, As of this year, uh, we were rated one of the top, 10 law firms in family law in the state of Illinois, um, as well as my, yeah, thank you. Um, as well as myself, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm one of the top two and a half percent of all attorneys in the state of Illinois in this area. Mm -hmm. So I can say that one of the most important things as well in this process is being able to have an attorney who you can trust and who you can contact, who know, who will be there when you need them and not like, this like nine to five attorney. I'm talking like my clients call me at, you know, Saturday night at 11 o'clock PM because there's an emergency or 
there something big happened or, you know, there was an issue during the exchange of the parenting time, you know, they can reach me. And I've got, I have three other attorneys, uh, associate attorneys that work for the firm as well. And, you know, we pride ourselves on that. That's, that's what makes us so much different. And I think well, and that's, if. No, I was going to say, and that's, you know, that's the, the only people we partner with are people who we feel go above and beyond the call of duty for divorces. And, uh, and you kind of led us into actually my next question for you, which is, um, how do you go about finding a great lawyer? I mean, obviously we talked about finding them on Dreams Recycle, but what when we meet with these lawyers or find them or are looking for them in any way, shape or form, what should we be looking for as a lay person, not a legal person? Can you give us some tips? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the first thing you're going to want to ask them is what their primary focus is in law. So, you know, like, if you had a brain injury, right, you're going to want to go to the best neurological doctor that there is. You're not going to go to, you know, an ears, nose and throat doctor. And maybe the ears, nose and throat doctor has some experience in neurological, you know, issues. But that's not somebody that you're going to want to go to because you're going to want the best of the best. You're going to want to have somebody who does this all day long. So I would ask them, you know, first and foremost, what is your primary practice? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can say for myself, which um, I I know I mentioned earlier, is family law, 100%. Right. So I tell clients, I'm not, you know, I'm not a personal injury lawyer. I'm not a bankruptcy attorney. I am very, very good at family law. And that's all I do. And that's Mm -hmm. what I've dedicated my practice to and my life to. So that would be the first thing. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I would ask is what recognition they have. So if they claim that they're really good in their field and that right. they only practice in family law, well, how have you been recognized as, you know, being very good in this area? And the recognitions and, you know, for example, like I said about my firm being the top 10 law firm in the state and mm-hmm. my recognitions as being top two and a half percent of all attorneys in the state in this area, like things like that, that set them apart mm-hmm. from other individuals because somebody could practice in family law all the time. It doesn't mean they're very good at it. <laughs> right. right. No, it's so, true. And how do you feel about Avo? Um, I think it's a good source um, just to, you know, get some information mm-hmm. in regard to what other clients think. Um, I often have my clients, you know, go on there and write a review for me after their case is finished, just to explain to other people who don't know me what their experience was like. Right. Um, it, you know, it would be a raging red flag though, right? If you went on any of these online sources and saw a lot of complaints about someone. I mean, I was looking the other day for a lawyer somewhere that we didn't have coverage for. And I, I was shocked at how many bad complaints some of these divorce attorneys have. Well, also keep in mind, I mean, there are some clients and, and I've had them and no matter what you do, I mean, you can do everything possible in your, in your power and your legal ability. Um, and, you know, you can be in contact with them all the time and do all of the work and they're still not happy. Right. Um, and well, so you've got to, right. And this is, this is actually an interesting conversation I was having the other day. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes even the lawyer doesn't know who is coming to them and what they are doing and, um, and can actually do pretty good smoke screen up until kind of almost the point of, you know, getting into a courtroom where I, where I've, uh, heard that then the lawyer is almost like, um, in shock as well of what, as what, you know, right. their client has been up to. And so right. I'm sure that's very difficult as a lawyer. Cause I'm sure that you will, um, sometimes get surprised at the end of the day also. Well, I'll tell you, for example, um, you know, I represented a client. I came in on an emergency motion. I, he didn't have any parenting time. The, uh, the mom was not allowing him any parenting time. I came in and I got him parenting time and it was a huge, huge battle. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, he, um, you know, he wasn't happy and, you know, people will still be unhappy. So when we're talking about reviews on Avo, I, I, I think that you should absolutely read them. 
I mm. think if you're if you're a good attorney, I think you're going to have a couple bad ones. And if you see all good ones on there, there's mm-hmm. probably something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. And, and yeah. if, for anybody out there that has great reviews and they have, you know, 50 something reviews and they're all, you know, positive, then, then good for you. I know personally, I have a couple that aren't great. Um, but again, these are people that no matter what you do, either they, you know, feel as though, um, you know, they don't, they just don't want to pay you for the time and the work that you put in their case. So they're, right. they're mad that they have to pay for services that were rendered mm-hmm. or they're just, they're just bitter. They're just mm-hmm. angry at the process. They're angry at yeah. everybody involved. And so oh, I, I and think also, also, I think sometimes people's version of what's fair and what's the law. I mean, I, I have heard many stories about you know people don't want well in the state of florida it's 50 50 so you know the whole they're not going to be happy with 50 they really want 75 percent of everything <laughs> and when they don't get that then they're unhappy and you know it comes right. the kind of umbrella of life that you really can't please everyone all the time no and and that's the thing and like i said i think avo is great i just think that you know you should look at the at the validity of what the individual who's writing the, you know, the review is saying. Mm-hmm. And a lot of attorneys will, re- they'll respond. Mm-hmm. So read well, the response and, and yeah. understand the situation. And, and if you have questions, you know, yeah. during the consultation with the attorney, ask them like, you know, you, I know you can't go into the details about what happened in the case specifically because it's attorney client privilege, but can you tell me like, what was the issue here? And I'm, 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 I can guarantee that if the individual is a good attorney, they will give you the, you know, the basis and the foundation of what happened. Right. So, so so what do you think? um, So, so we kind of, we've got all our ducks in a row with our paperwork and our information and our personal possessions. And now we've gone out and we've tried the best we can to kind of find a, a decent lawyer. I mean, I personally, one of the things that I did um, the second, third time around before I even started Dreams Recycled was, you know, word of mouth referrals, I think are pretty good. You know, if you trust somebody and they've had a good experience, then I think this kind of is a good reference. And, um, but so we've, so we found our lawyer. And so going through the divorce process, um, do you have any kind of advice on how, uh, to kind of handle ourselves through the legal process. Because I know, you know, for people like me who had never been in a court of law before our divorce, we never had any legal action, we never kind of thing. It's all very kind of nerve wracking and daunting. And I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, like, even just walking past the courthouse, you know, they started to feel sick, that they were so nervous about kind mm-hmm. of what the whole process is. So what advice do you have to regular people who, you know, are not in the legal field on how to kind of get through their divorce in kind of a healthier way through the legal process? Well, let me put it this way, and this kind of reverts back to what we were talking about before in regards to the hiring of an attorney. You know, you should feel comfortable, very comfortable with your attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, The joke that a client of mine uh, told me a couple years ago was, you know, by the time we're done, you're going to know my bra size, my underwear color, you know, because it's so personal, right? Right. I mean, Uh you know everything. You know financials. I know how much you make. I, I know you know, what happened in your, in your romantic relationship with your husband. I I know all of these things. So Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, your attorney should be there explaining the process. And that's what I do. So I give them a rundown of kind of what to expect. Now, Mm -hmm. if I were to explain every single hypothetical situation, I would be on the phone or in person with the client for four days. I mean, it it would take a substantial amount of time. Mm -hmm. But I give them an idea of what to expect in different segments. So the first part, we're going to do this. Then we're going to move on to this. We'll see what happens with this. If that happens, then we'll move Mm -hmm. on to this. Mm -hmm. So I break it up for them so that if you throw all the information at a client at one time, when they're going through such a difficult period in their life, they're going to shut down and they're Mm -hmm. going to become and feel overwhelmed. And that's not what I want to do. I want them to feel as comfortable and as relaxed as possible. And I know that's hard to do, but 
giving the client the knowledge of the process helps them through the process. Right. No, I agree. And I think fear is based on lack of knowledge a lot of times. And if you, if people are a little bit like me, I tend to be a worrier a lot, <laughs> but, uh, you know, simple things. Yeah. Like, um, but that's know, normal. Yeah. Whether it's mediation, whether it's positive thinking, whether it's deep breaths, I mean, even little things can kind of help a little bit. And then, like I said, if you partner with a lawyer that you really trust and they can really make you feel secure in what's going to happen and, and tell you, you know, what's coming, then I feel that this is kind of a good way forward through the legal process. Because I do, I do think it's very intimidating. It's very scary. You feel almost like you're on trial. Like, what did you do? But, you know, there's some right. kind of that factor. And, and you don't know what's coming, you know, because um, especially if you get to the point of actually going to trial, obviously it becomes a very, very big thing. But even in the minor thing, and I think so much is lying, you know, kind of lying on what the results are, whether it's time with our children, whether it's our financial outcome. I mean, I think that it's just human nature that it's going to be a very stressful time and a very stressful situation. So I think you're correct, you know, partnering with a good lawyer who you trust and respect and you believe is going to do a good job, you know, trying to stay positive, trying to be healthy in mind and body and now however else you can would be a good step forward too. And, um, and I think at the end of the day, maybe you just have to have a little bit of faith in the legal system that, you know, there is some kind of fairness. And I know that's hard for the family law system, which sometimes seems to have very strange outcomes for people but um, I, I kind of feel that you have to have a little bit of faith in it. You do. And you have to hope that, you know, the judge and the court system overall is going to be equitable and be fair and be seeking the best interests of the children as well. And so, mm -hmm. you know, again, when I, you know, I'll, I'll receive a petition from opposing counsel and, you know, a lot of attorneys, which is absolutely crazy to me, mm -hmm. don't even send, they don't, not only do they not follow up with clients, they don't um, keep them up to date in regards to court dates. They don't send them court orders. They don't, you know, they don't do anything. So a lot of clients come to me and say, Tiffany, I haven't spoken to my attorney in three weeks. And I said, well, did you get the court order from the last court date? And they're like, no, they never send me court orders. And I'm like, they, they don't send you the documents for your case. So mm -hmm. when I send over a pleading, to a client, um, I call them or I send them an email. You know, they might be at work, so sometimes email's better. But, and I'll say, look, we received this. Take a look at it. Take a deep breath when you do. I know there's a lot of garbage in here that's not true. Mm -hmm. That kind of part of the process during litigation, the other party mm -hmm. file thing that's probably not necessarily true. Well, or and that, that's in facts. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, I remember the first time I was served and then the second time I was served, now it's on the third time. And it is, it's scary. You open that and it's, you know, 18 pages of producing this and that and the other and things and demands and you it is. It's very, very scary when you don't know that, you know, maybe half of it or more is just kind of the lack of the kind of legal standard jargon that kind of is thrown in there. Right. And and then clients are so upset and so concerned and are so afraid because the attorneys don't explain it. So I explain it. I say, this is what it is. This is what we're going to do. You know, this is procedurally what's going to happen next. And I let them know from the very get go of kind of what to expect going forward now that we've received it. So it goes back to what I was saying before is number one, have an attorney who knows what they're doing and is going to be communicating with you and you know, it's going to be staying on top of everything in your case and we'll be there to communicate things to you as things arise. Because if you don't have that, then you do feel very alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of clients are um, very, you know, they reach out to an attorney and they, the attorney says, well, you know, today for, if you, if you sign up with me today, it'll only be $500 down and we can get started right away. And it seems attractive, but mm. yeah, that's not realistic. And so when you're looking for an attorney, I just want to note that, you know, just like you wouldn't price shop a brain surgeon, you know, you should obviously take a look at what the attorney is going to charge, but right. the retainer well, that's paid, 
you know, mm-hmm. that, that if somebody quotes you $500 to start, I think you, you know, if it kind of, if it kind of doesn't sound right to you, it probably isn't right. Right. Um, and, and, and so, go ahead. No, it should just, it should raise a red flag. There's a lot of chop shops mm-hmm. in, in Illinois who do this $500 down now. And they never explain to the client that, you know, this month we're going to have so much work. It's probably going to be 5,000. Mm-hmm. So instead of selling, instead of telling the client, like, let's start off at 5,000, um, which is a reasonable amount considering that particular case. And, and not all cases are like that. And, and there's a lot of cases that are, you know, don't cost as much to begin with and cost mm-hmm. a lot more to begin with. It just depends on what's happening. But, you know, what these attorneys will do is they'll have you sign on mm-hmm. and after the $500 is gone, now you have a balance of $4,500 for that month. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, nobody told me it was going to be that much this month or, you know, mm-hmm. even give me an idea that it might be approximate, you know, approximately well, that much. Well, and I want to point out at this point, because I get asked about this a lot and, and Dreams Recycle, we don't give legal advice. We're not a legal entity. Um, we help triage you to uh, obviously professionals in all the different fields that can help you better. Um, but we do give a lot of like practical advice on things that we've just know from my personal experience of talking to over 6,000 divorcees. And, um, one of the things that I think people aren't aware of is whatever you decide on your marriage settlement is very, very hard to undo after the fact. So I tell people you're better to have a better lawyer first time around than then try and undo the mess that you created. Oh, absolutely. I can't tell you. Uh, how many times people have come to me after the fact and they go with some chop shop. And what's even more disturbing is that the lawyer sues them for the remaining balance. So they're under the assumption, okay, I'm going to pay $500 today, but they make it seem as though that there's not much more fees after that. And then the attorney, the chop shop place um, comes after the client. And so you want to, if something, again, if something doesn't sound right, it's not right. I mean, I think everybody needs to use their own judgment with this, but well, I tell it's clients. Like every, yeah, it's like everything in life. You're better to do it correctly the first time because, you know, anything in life, it's hard to redo it. It's hard to, yeah. you know, kind of put a broken egg back together. It's never going to be quite the same. So at least when you start the divorce process, you kind of have a clean slate and you can work towards getting a fair settlement for both of you and fair custody for both of you and do it right the first time. Because I I don't know this as a statistic, but from the people I talk to, I'm going to say they spend more money going back to court after the fact than initially when they went to court when it's not. I was just going to say that. that I was just going to say, if you decide to go with an attorney based on price only and not looking at, you know, the attorney's credentials Mm -hmm. and they end up entering something that is completely, you know, not reasonable. Mm -hmm. And and let me explain just because an attorney is an attorney doesn't mean that that attorney knows family law. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. But it also doesn't mean they actually care. I mean, no, uh, you know, no, it, of it course not. That they care. I really think, you know, some of these cases, the lawyer doesn't even look at what these people have decided to settle with. And, and then after the fact, you know, it's too late. It's too late that you accepted that you were only getting 10%. And it's too late that you accepted that you were only getting two nights a week of child custody. Right, and, right. And, when you enter into an agreement, to then later on say this is not what I agreed to, um, it doesn't it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, you entered into agreement. There was a bargain for exchange for this agreement. Um, usually, you're going to be going back and forth between the attorneys and making changes to it. Mm-hmm. And then if you later decide that, well, that's not what I wanted, and I realized I could have gotten a lot more, but my attorney was subpar. You're in a really really bad situation and. Mm-hmm. Under Illinois law, if it's after the 30-day period to vacate um, that judgment, then we have to file a motion under 1401, um, which is to vacate it, you know, in its entirety. And it's very, very hard to do so uh, Mm -hmm. when you have a situation where you've already agreed. So, you know, making sure that you 
get a good attorney who's going to be not only knowledgeable in the law, but is also going to be explaining things to you and making sure that they're seeking your best interests and the children's best interests is, is so very important. So just be on the lookout for people that just don't seem ethical, that don't seem like they're, you know, seeking your best interests. I mean, mm-hmm. at this point, I have people call me and if, if clients are, you know, if they're trying to, you know, hurt the children or um, are completely unreasonable and are wanting to either, you know, negatively affect the children or the other party, I mean, I tell clients I'm not interested in taking the case. You know, there's a lot of attorneys, they'll take every single case. Right. Um, always. I had a client that came in and he he told me during the consultation that he he physically um, physically hurt and abused his four-year-old daughter. Oh, Lord. And I quoted him a ridiculous retainer for like $25,000, something ridiculous, thinking he's never going to come back. And he came back the next day with a cashier's check. Mm-hmm. And I told him I wouldn't take his case. Right. But there's tons of attorneys that will take anything and everything. And, mm-hmm. and they don't care. And they don't care about you. It's a business. And, and for me, this is my life. Mm-hmm. The people I work with every day, my clients, you know, we are very, very close. So you want to have that kind of relationship. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. You want to have that relationship with your attorney. Yeah, no, no. And, um, and I, like I said, um, we've been working together and I know you do a great job and, um, and I'm very, very grateful to you for coming on our show today and we're going to wrap. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. But I, uh, I think you've given our listeners a lot to think about, a lot of good tips, and um, hopefully it will be helpful to them. And I just wanted to uh, um, ask you, how can they find you? Um, So you can call my office at 773-893-0228. You can also go to my website. It's uh, www.t, is in Tiffany, it's my first name, my last name, Hughes law all one word dot com um, or um, listeners are free to email me at tiffany hughes at t hughes law dot com as well um, you know whatever works for them is is fine by me so please don't hesitate to reach out to me okay well thank you so much thank you for all your help and your tips and we wish you well and we will be linking all your information anyone who's looking for tiffany if you didn't catch her number or email here if you look in the itunes description you will see her information and we uh you can also find her on our website dreamsrecycled.com if you're in the chicago area um check her out but thank you tiffany and uh, thank, thank you, you so much. It was a pleasure. I hopefully I helped a, a couple people out today. <laughs> no, I'm sure you did. And thank you. And thank you to our listeners. And we will be back next week. So until then, dream big.